Welcome to another edition of the Dog or Pass podcast. Paul Shaughnessy here. I want to give you a reminder to give the show a like, share it, tell your friends. We're trying to get our numbers up here. Joined by Cody Saftik here to break down UFC Liverpool, jolly old England. Main event, uh, we got Darren Till versus Stephen Thompson. Till goes on about how he's like this massive, massive superstar here. They sold out the arena really fast, but it's the first time they've ever went to Liverpool. I wonder how much of like a factor this is going to be going into it. We haven't really seen the, you know, the open workouts or the weigh-ins. Like those are kind of little gauges for it heading into it. But uh, Wonder Boy likes to go to decision. It's going to be interesting. Darren Till talks it up like he's Conor McGregor in Dublin or, frankly, Stipe Miocic in Cleveland. I remember watching Stipe walk in against Alistair Overeem in Cleveland. And I'm like, there's no way that Stipe's losing tonight. And he almost got knocked out. But like he wasn't getting knocked out in front of uh, in front of you know all of his fans and all of his supporters. Like sometimes an arena can have a big adv- or can be a big advantage for a fighter. So we got Till Thompson, 8400 Thompson, 7800 for Till. Uh, Till was as high as plus 150 as of like a day ago, and um, and now. He's uh, minus minus 105, minus 115. Who do you like? Yeah, it seems like a big singular belt bet might have come in on Darren Till that mm-hmm. have kind of yeah, made this an moved, evening money like, fight. like, li- really sharp immediately. Yeah, you know what? This is a strange spot for me personally because I'm going to go with Wonder Boy. I'm sure we'll get into that in a moment. But the $7,800 on Till for DraftKings, it seems like in a fight that, A, is, if it goes five rounds, uh, he's going to have a plethora of opportunities to score and two I mean man that's straight left that might be a killer shot for a guy like Stephen Thompson Till doesn't go out there and throw particular volume I know he's an exciting striker but if you look back at the majority of his body of work yeah. he likes to just pick those counter shots the last fight against Cowboy was literally the, the anomaly in how this guy fights yeah that's true and what do you do against, like he's pretty smart he's like what do you do to have an easy win against Donald Cowboy Cerrone you barnstorm him and you go at him really fast out of the gate and he, he put up I think like 55 strikes in the first round. Yeah. It's like other fights that he's had that have been three round decisions. Like he's putting up like 80. Like his volume was way over the top from what we're used to seeing from him. Yeah. I, I agree with you. I think he goes back to more of a counter selection. And that may actually work against uh, Thompson. Because Thompson, if you charge him, his game is predicated off of uh, pressure fighters coming at him. And when they come at him, he basically, you know, Takes, takes his counter shot and moves off on an angle. We saw it against uh, Masvidal. We were high on Wonder Boy heading into his fight against Masvidal in that fight. And it's because we were just like, we don't see a counter game from him. So it's an interesting one. I'll, sorry, I cut you off, but I'll let you No, man, I agree. Continue. I agree 100%. Steven Thompson probably fights his best fights when he's moving backwards. In the fights that he's got to now come for, let's say the Tyron Woodley fights, where Woodley is not looking to exert any energy. Backs so up against the cage. He just backs up, and what happens is Thompson will, he'll follow you. He does a good job of cutting off angles, but he doesn't throw much. He almost reminds me in that regard of like Holly Holm. If you want to come forward on Holly Holm, she's a fantastic counterpuncher. She's got great kicks, she's got great movement. When she has to lead the dance, when she has to be the fighter that's being aggressive, she will back you up. We just don't see really the volume is, from her. This she is Holm versus much. Shevchenko all over. It's just, it depends on what Till does. Now, all of this wrapped into one makes this a kind of, if Till is smart and he doesn't chase after him and he just, you know, he uses his uh, counter right hook and he uses his, his the leg. straight left, I think, would, would, he, he would serve uses him his well. leg kicks and, and, and straight left when it's there. It's still, this is like potentially very low volume fight this, yeah. that could go to decision. Low volume. They're in, uh, they're in Liverpool. And we go to decision. There hasn't been too much action on either side. Even if Wonder Boy's landing a little bit more, we would have to probably agree that the more uh, cleaner and a harder strike's probably getting landed by Darren Till in arena that's roaring every single time that he lands a punch. You smell that? If I can counter to that argument, is that when you look at Stephen Wonderboy Thompson versus Rory McDonald, nothing happens, dude. Literally nothing yeah. happens. Rory stands in front of him. He's not moving forward, and Stephen Thompson's is the guy that's kind of moving forward a little bit. He's just somewhat outstriking him. The bigger shots are really not being landed by either guy. The fight's in Ottawa. The fight is in Rory's home, not his hometown, but I mean it's in it's in his home country. And Canada, terrible judges. 
But it, it was kind of a unanimous thing that, okay, Stephen Thompson uh, beat Rory McDonald. If that same type of fight happens here, where you have Darren Till being the guy that's looking to counterpunch, and at least it's Stephen Thompson with the flasher of the strikes, Stephen Thompson with better the better low kick game, Stephen Thompson with just a little bit more, then maybe he's going to get it. Another big thing that I'm kind of worrying about for Darren Till is that he is a massive 170-pound fighter. And when you look at his fights in the UFC, maybe he's not putting... Uh, pedal to the metal in, in the majority of them because he doesn't want to gas himself out. He missed weight by six pounds against Yesen Ayari. Came in at 176 pounds for that fight. So it's not crazy to think that the guy struggles to make weight. Now you're putting him in a five round situation. If it gets to those quote unquote championship rounds, then I have to go with Stephen Thompson, a guy that has looked pretty good. He looks pretty energetic in those in those last couple of rounds. I honestly personally thought he beat Tyron Woodley that second time around and then following up that with the George Masvidal win. The guy could very well be the champion of the UFC, but unfortunately, in my opinion, some bad judges cost him the second rematch with Woodley and uh, and as a result, you're not the champion, right? But he's still a top guy. When you look at Darren Till, Darren Till's body of work in the UFC consists of beating Wendell Oliveira, who's no longer employed by the UFC. He beat Boyan, him and Boyan Velikovic. Boyan Velikovic is no longer employed by the UFC. His fight with, um, sorry, when he separated Justin his shoulder. Ayari. Well, Ayari Nicholas still. Nicholas Dalby. Yeah, Nicholas Dalby. That fight was a draw. Dalby no longer employed with the company and actually just lost a fight on the Cage Warriors card, which we'll talk about. You know, we have the, the victor of that fight on this card later down, but. I think it's he's got five fights in the UFC. Donald Cerrone is obviously still there. Yes, and he already hasn't fought in a year and is coming off the loss. But the majority of the guys that he's fought inside of the UFC are no longer employed by the promotion. Yep. Whereas if you look at Stephen Thompson, he's fighting all of the best guys. Of course. His, his last, when you're fighting, you know, even Johnny Hendricks, who's a shot version of Johnny Hendricks, at least it's a former world champion. At least when you're fighting back to back fights with Tyron Woodley, that's championship rounds, big experience. The fight with George Monsvidal, if you're thinking to yourself, well, maybe, uh, maybe. You know, Thompson at age 34, 35, maybe he's slowing down. Maybe he's not the same guy. Maybe his chin's not as good as it used to be because we've seen Woodley hurt him. You know, I think George Masvidal's always in close fights. And Wonderboy is one of the few guys that went out there and beat this guy. So I got to feel like the movement's going to favor him. I got to feel like the speed's going to favor him. I got to I gotta feel like the five-round championship fight, you know, the fact that it's going to have those additional 10 minutes in it, it's not for championship, obviously, but you know what I mean. You get in those extra rounds. I feel like that's got to favor him. Till's got to knock him out. Till's got to land that one big shot. Till's got to time it well, hit Wonder Boy. We've robbery, seen Wonder Boy man. get low volume it's robbery. Possible. Hey, it's possible. But the seventy-eight hundred dollars, even if it's a low volume robbery over the course of five rounds, if he gets the win and it's going to be a striking battle for the most part, then I don't mind this guy whatsoever. But I would he's twenty-five. He's still got a ways to learn. It's a tough one to call. I see a lot of people who are just like, "This guy's definitely going to win on both yeah. sides of the coin here." Sure, right. Um, if you like Thompson and you want to bet him, I this line just keeps moving towards Till, so I would just wait it out at this point because I think it's gonna, I think Thompson's gonna go off as the the underdog as we get closer to fight time here. Um, my preferred play on DraftKings is is Darren Till. For the home cooking, he's got a great, and, great value, and he has if he has he's he has a better chance, I think, of getting you know like a first round finish, just going barnstorming and maybe getting lucky. But playing a pressure game against Thompson is the blueprint to lose against Stephen Wonderboy yeah, Thompson. Yeah, yeah, and people, the way to win is what Woodley did. You back up, yeah. you make it slow, you make it drawn out. But all of these things could kind of favor Till in front of his home crowd that'll be cheering for him every time he lands a punch. Yeah, fair enough. But my last point on it is people are very quick to point out about how good Till looked against Donald Cerrone. First of all, they should have rebooked Till quickly thereafter. He took no damage in that fight. Yeah. He had a lot of hype. He was talking some mad shit on, on social media. They should have booked him soon thereafter. Instead, he's waited on the sideline for a little bit. I'm sure he's only getting better in the gym, don't get me wrong. The way that guy spars, Pretty much like he's fighting all the time in the gym. But if we look back to his last fight as being his most impressive, obviously the one that really stands out, his other fights in the UFC hadn't really stood out all that much. That last fight was Cerrone. You know, that's the big feather in his cap. Cerrone is a tiny welterweight against Darren Till, who's a massive welterweight. I honestly feel like that size discrepancy plays huge. You can barnstorm, just like you say, go after Donald Cerrone, hurt this guy early, get him out of his game plan, take him out. Yep. The blue pairing on beating Donald Cerrone has been put there, and Till can do that. If he tries to use that exact same game plan against Stephen Thompson, I think you nailed it. Now he's taking on a guy who counterpunching is his, the name of his game. Yep. This is what he wants to do. And he's going to have the size that even if he does get hit, we've seen him get nailed flush by Tyron Woodley. He did go down. However, However, he did not get knocked out. He fought his way back into the fight. He takes it into those deep waters, and that's where he kind of starts to outwork you ever so slightly. But I, I think we're in agreement that even though this is the best fight on the card, and even though this should scream excitement because you have two traditionally good action fighters, it could this be, could be a dud, man. Yeah, this could be a totally mega could. dud. Uh, that fight is super, super close by the cards. 
This next one that we have, we have Neil Magny taking on late replacement Craig White. Magny, the most expensive guy on the card, uh, 9,500 on DraftKings, and a minus 620 favorite. That line's just been creeping up all week. Taking on Craig White, who can be had for 6,700 and four, plus 460, respectively. I was watching tape on Craig White just being like, I don't want to pay up so much for Neil Magny. I'm looking at it with like with the type of eyes and the type of uh, bias that you're not supposed to look at these types of things at all with. And I just couldn't. I just couldn't see really much of a path to victory. I don't really think this Craig White guy uh, does, uh, belongs here. The one thing he is good at is jujitsu, and, and most of his wins, his most recent wins, are all by submission. Neil Magny was, cre uh, was getting ready for, for Gunnar Nelson. The, the idea of going to the ground at any time was completely thrown out the door. I think he watches a little bit of tape on Craig White. He says, all right, game plan doesn't really change. I just stay at distance. I, I throw jabs and, uh, and hopefully pepper and, and, and beat this guy down over the course of three rounds. That being said, I don't know if he pays 9,500. If Craig White is able to survive, get, go the distance. That's the only way you can really get away from Neil Magny, but he should roll here as the line and the DraftKings price predicates. Yeah, no, I'm going to agree with you. Listen, he's, he's getting ready for a big fight against Gunnar Nelson in the co-main event slot, and now you're taking on a, a fighter who is four weeks removed from, from fighting. He's not really exact. Like, he, he's in a situation here where they're in his home country. They need a guy last minute. I guess he's from Wales, right? Mm -hmm. I, they're in Europe. They need a guy last minute. They call Cage Warriors matchmaker Graham Boyle. Hey, we need a guy. Do you got a guy? Oh, yeah, I got a guy, 170 pounds. He just takes the fight. He's been fighting professionally for nearly 10 years now. He, he even says himself in interviews, I didn't ever think I was going to get to the UFC. So when the phone comes ringing, you pick up that phone. Sure. He started his career like six and five. Now, most of those fights are at 185 pounds, but he didn't particularly have a very good chin, and that's something that worries me. Drops down to 170 pounds, had fought very infrequently, dealt with injuries, and now hits this four-fight winning streak against mostly British regional talent. The thing is, is that you look at the four wins, and they're all four by way of finish. One TK over Matt Inman, the other wins by submission. But, like, the Hick on Foss fight, he just shoots a really sloppy takedown right to a guillotine. Damn heavens. It looks those, real amateur in the clinch, uh, like the, the, the fights that he's having at this Two level of those too. other fights, triangle choke. Now, the triangle choke, not likely to work at this level and not going to work against Neil Magny. Now, yes, he has lost by triangle choke against Sergio Marais. Now, people are quick to be like, Neil Magny has no submission defense. Man, his losses by submission are against Sergio Marais, who's a third-degree black belt, you know, one of the best jiu-jitsu practitioners in the UFC, Damian Maya, credentials, enough said, yeah, sure. and Rafael you, Dos Anjos, You could make that well. argument when he was taking on Gunnar Nelson, but he's not taking on Gunnar Nelson. Anymore. And he's had a full camp working. Okay, how do I beat Gunnar Nelson? And not get choked out against a world class uh, jiu jitsu practitioner, which has been my real big back. Uh, downfall in my career. You know, but one thing I'm slightly worried about is that obviously the game plan for Gunnar Nelson was don't go to the ground. And I think you make a good point when you say that you just keep the same game plan, go about this guy, box this guy up, don't take it to the ground. But Craig White is terrible takedown defense. Terrible. Neil Manny's actually a pretty good wrestler. That's yeah. one improvement that he's made massively. His clinch game against the fence is pretty good. His takedowns are pretty good. If he can go out there and take down Craig White, all he has to do is neutralize that grappling. It's not like Craig White is some awesome jiu-jitsu guy. It's that he's beating regional show level guys by rapid Rather sloppy submissions. But grinding. He's actually a Taekwondo black belt. Got his black belt by 15, transitioned after 15, started training MMA at 17. Now he's 27, 10 years of MMA experience. When you watch his striking, dude, it's super sloppy. But he's got a willingness to strike. He will move forward. He will throw strikes. I think Neil Magny's got him all over here. However, if you look at the Neil Magny versus Lorenz Larkin, Lorenz Larkin 10 times the striker here. But you can kind of more or less bum rush Neil Magny back him up against the cage, and hope to just land something on him. If I'm coming in on short notice and I'm Craig White, I, that's probably what my game plan is. I'm a Taekwondo black belt, sure. land some flashy kick, hurt this guy. So I would like to see Magny not just use the same Gunnar Nelson game plan. I don't want to necessarily see him just keep the fight standing at distance and try to use that 80 inch reach of his. Take this guy down. Style on him on the ground. I do not doubt for one minute that Neil Magny can submit Craig White. He can knock out Craig White. Mm -hmm. 9,500 is a huge price. You're going to need that finish. You're going to need multiple takedowns and some guard passes and a finish, hopefully, in the second round to get uh, the value out of him. However, if you go with some of the, the value plays on this card that are not looking sexy, you can afford Neil Magny, and uh, I'm going to have some lineups that have him on. Moving on down the card, we have Arnold Allen taking on Mads Burnell. Arnold Allen, 9,200 on DraftKings. Burnell. 
nine or seven thousand minus two seventy five Allen plus two thirty five Brunel. Who do you like? See, I don't necessarily love Mads Brunel, but the seven thousand dollar price tag is extremely appealing on him because if you're going to look at a GPP player, you're going to look at somebody that's considered a punt play. The seven thousand is exactly that. And when you're looking at some of the other options, who's got a good option for a finish here? Maybe it's Mads Brunel. The kid's only twenty four years old. He's already a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belt. He looked terrible against Michelle Prezeres. But, but Prezeres has went moved up to one seventy, <laughs> and he just beat Zach. Cummings like he's that a, he's a top got 10 two guy. rounds with him Prezeres yeah. came in at like eight pounds over for that fight he was way Prezeres he was does. way bigger than him your whole game plan is hopefully get some takedowns from Prezeres yeah that's not gonna happen your whole game plan is maybe get a submission on Prezeres yeah that's not gonna happen so what was he really gonna do his last fight against Mike Santiago I didn't think he looked awesome but one thing he was able to do is get the fight to the ground three times and when he did get the fight to the ground he showed off you know what really not that bad on the ground he's a guy that's competed a lot at the uh IBJJF level in Europe. He's had some success. And as I mentioned, even though he's from Denmark, it's probably not the highest level of black belt. 24 years old in the black belt. Mm -hmm. Obviously, he's good at jiu-jitsu. Obviously, he's someone that's progressed really quickly, and that's kind of his go-to. Arnold Allen, meanwhile, also 24 years old, he, he he's still kind of a green fighter. We haven't seen him fight in a while because he battled some injuries and some visa problems. He's at TriStar, obviously, so that should help him you yeah, know, getting to work with. Yeah, fight or something, didn't he? Yeah, and then he, and then he was having trouble get his visa. Maybe it's off and stop. D doesn't really matter. Hence why he's fighting in England. Yeah, the main thing is he can't ship him off anywhere else. Well, he he trains in Canada. He is at TriStar. Oh, is he? Back yeah, there? yeah. So at least he's able to make that trek, so to speak. But as, on a full time, regular basis, who knows? Um, I feel like that he is stronger. I feel like he is a much better boxer. Mm -hmm. I feel like if he just keeps the fight standing, he should be able to hit Burnell and hurt Burnell. But he doesn't have one stop, stop one punch stopping power. So I don't really think he's just going to go out there and knock Burnell clean out. That allows Burnell to hopefully time on one of these punches, duck under, get this fight to the ground. Even if you have to pull guard, try to get this fight to the ground. And then who knows? Maybe you can make something happen. His last fight against Amira Mar uh, Marquani, sorry, uh, Marquani is a wrestler, don't get me wrong, but Marquani gets him down three times. Marquani should have lost that fight unanimous, but the fight is somewhat close, and a lot of that is him being able to get those takedowns on Arnold Allen. If Mads Burnell goes out there and he gets these takedowns on Arnold Allen, and he can put him in a compromising situation and maybe get that submission, then your lineup would need to have him at $7,000 to yep. win the big cheap BP. So if you take him, then you can afford a Neil Magny, and they both come through you're sitting good. So I like Arnold Allen. I've always been a fan of his. Like I said, I think he's going to be the stronger guy. He's going to be a little quicker. And he, if the fight stays standing, it's his to win. But I can't overlook that value on Burnell, especially when I look at some of the other guys that are cheap. I don't like them as much as I don't mind him. No, uh, you basically kind of summed up everything I was going to say about that fight. Um, the thing about it is Arnold Allen, 9,200. He's, he's going to need an early finish or he's just going to have to box on him, uh, on Burnell like crazy. And you know, he averages like 73 points per per uh, for, per fight. 9,200, it's not really likely that he pays off that price tag. Whereas Burnell, we know what he's going to try to do, and that's gonna he's going to be getting boxed up. He's probably going to be losing every single moment until the one moment that he potentially wins. And as a GPP flyer, Burnell, 7,000. When you go below 7,000, it gets real dicey. Yeah, so no doubt about it. He would be my preferred play, and I will have some Mads Burnell. Moving on down, we've got Jason Knight, 8,300, and a minus 155 favor. Taking on Mac Juan, Amir Khani, uh, 7,900, plus 135. This one's a tough one to kind of think about. Uh, just because Maquan is so, so infrequent, he doesn't fight all that often. And he's very, for a guy who kind of, when he first broke in, wanted to be like the center of attention and stuff, the guy goes pretty dark silent in between fight camps. And we don't really know what he's up to. We know he's a good wrestler. We know what he's going to try to do. But the problem is his gas tank isn't very good. When we get to round three, Jason Knight, knock him all you want pretty good to gas tank and this guy is ferocious and is going to keep coming so it's an interesting tough fight to call Amir Khani if, you th if you're confident that he can land the takedowns and then kind of hold off night in round three I don't hate him as a play he could, he could have tremendous upside but uh, Jason Knight is probably the safer play here um, I, I, I think I'm just going to avoid Knight I, I'm not sure where his headspace is at right now but uh, interesting fight, to say, to say the least. Who do you like? Yeah, I'm going to take some Jason Knight, actually. I I'm not going to just completely abandon this kid and the potential that he probably still does have, even though he's had two rather devastating losses. Gabriel Benitez has proven to be, you know, a badass, to be honest with you. And prior to that, Ricardo Lamas, I think those are the two kind of losses that you could take in stride, hopefully. He's still young. He's still hopefully getting better. 
I feel like he matches up good with Maquan Amerikani in this spot. Maquan Amerikani, it's entirely possible that this guy's just a, a hype job. He comes to the UFC, he didn't really have any big notable victories outside of Tom Dukanoy, who was like 18 years old at the time, prior to coming to the UFC. But he's super good looking, and the ladies like him, and he's got this video of him eating this goddamn apple that goes viral. Comes to the UFC, he nails Andy Ogle in spectacular fashion with the flying knee. And since then, people just love Mako and Amir Khan. They want to cheer for him. But he hasn't looked particularly good. He wins his next outing, don't get me wrong, gets the finish. Then after that, he fights Mike Wilkinson. I thought that was a fight he looked super suspect in. Mike Wilkinson has actually, <clears throat> since gotten cut from the UFC, gone to the regional scene, cannot win in the regional scene ever. Not even there. So that's a decision victory for him. Eh. And then his fight with Arnold Allen. I mean, they're all so spaced out. You expect to see some huge, you know, uh, benefit from him, a huge improvement from him. We just don't see it. His last fight with Arnold Allen, I thought that that's where he kind of got exposed. His gas tank certainly didn't all look, look all that good. And even though he's able to complete three takedowns, he largely struggles. He wasn't guys, able to like, maintain position. The guy's almost a one-trick pony with his wrestling. I mean, he was a finished wrestling standout, but I don't even know how much of a standout he was, Paul. He never really wrestled beyond the finish level, and he never really won beyond the under-18s. He's got a couple gold medals at the finish level and at the European level at under 18 and since then it's all silvers and bronze he never really went progressed beyond that so he gets into fighting and that wrestling allows him to take down some of these scrubs in the regional scene he beats these guys he makes it to the ufc he beats a couple putzes in the ufc then when the competition level starts to rise it's not even rising astronomically he's starting to, to kind of falter so how does he match up against jason knight well jason knight is takedowns really not that bad his takedown defense he leaves a little bit to the imagination but he's very raw and he's a very strong guy and when you look at his fight with say chaz skelly chaz skelly's a way better wrestler than, than Makwan Mirakani is, but you just, you pressure this guy. You hurt this guy. He gets you down a couple times, Jason Knight's way better off his back. He'll throw up those triangles. He'll throw up those arm bars. If he doesn't fight that stupid game plan against Kawajiri, where I'm just going to try to submit Kawajiri the whole time, you're not going to submit Kawajiri. Just get up, dude. Get up, and when you get Don't on him... Don't just throw up lazy triangles because you're losing from that position. Yeah, and, and the way Knight fights, you've either got to finish this guy or you've got to have an awesome gas tank because he always comes forward. He always pressures you. He's a guy that doesn't... I know a lot of people will say he doesn't seem all that intelligent. He knows when to go for the takedown. You'll hear him between rounds. He'll go back to his corner, and he'll be like, I think I stole that round back with the takedown. And like He's thinking about that stuff. He's thinking about getting those points. But also, he's a fighter's fighter. He wants to get in the pocket. He wants to make this a war. He wants to make this gritty. And those are all things that Mack Wedemir Khan doesn't really want to do. He wants to keep some distance until you get close enough to him that he'll try to take you down. When he takes you down, he'll try to positionally hold, he'll try to, you know, positionally hold you down. Doesn't really advance his position all that much. Whereas, I feel like Jason Knight's got the striking advantage. Jason Knight's got the jiu-jitsu advantage. If the fight does hit the ground, I think he'll be more than comfortable off his back and able to get this fight up, and he's just going to push it. <clears throat> he's going to use that cardio advantage to hopefully just break down Mack Wani Amirakani. I can see this fight going the distance. I don't think he's going to necessarily knock out Amirakani. I don't think he's necessarily going to submit Amirakani. The $8,300 is not that bad. And if I'm going for a cash game play especially, I think Jason Knight's not going to get finished here. He's going to get three rounds. The way this guy fights, he's probably going to get a decent amount in those three rounds, and i like him to get that decision, or hopefully if you're rostering up on a GPP and you want the big points, Hopefully he's able to get that finish, but I'm going to take uh, Jason Knight the minus 155 on the straight money line. I do not mind that either. Manny Bermudez, 8,800 on DraftKings, minus 225 on the betting line, taking on Davey Grant, who can be had for 7,400 and plus 185. I'm not all that impressed from what I've seen with Bermudez. I did. I faded him on DraftKings, yeah, and that, that cost me. <clears throat> yeah. But like watching tape and stuff, this guy seems like a relatively like a one-trick pony. Um but the one thing about it, and there's going to be another couple spots on this card, is that the one spot where he succeeds, his opponent seems to struggle. So I wouldn't be shocked to see Bermudez get, uh, get a submission here. That's where Davy Grant has really struggled over the course of his career is when he gets into transitions on the ground and, and grappling. Um, he has been submitted at least, at least two times off the top of my head here. Both of his losses in the UFC. Bermudez is a is a GPP play, if anything at all. But the fade train is coming on this guy. I just don't know if this is the matchup. 
Yeah, dude, I agree. He's actually really young. So I think that's one of the reasons yeah. I faded him in his debut is Albert Morales is a grimy veteran. He's been in the UFC before. He's put up good performance. He had never been submitted. So what's going to happen to this kid once he tries these submissions? It doesn't work. And Albert Morales is able to, you know, start keeping the fight standing and bop this guy up. I didn't think he looked great against Albert Morales. But one thing is that he's probably got that UFC jitters. Those bright lights are, are on him for the first time. He didn't really have an extended camp for that fight. I think it was fairly short notice. But he still got the takedowns when he needed them. When he couldn't get them, he just got the fight to the ground. Let Albert Morales get on top of you. He's better on the ground. And eventually, he submits Morales. Morales had, hadn't really shown a propensity for gassing out in the UFC. He actually had pretty good cardio. And when I'm watching his fight with Bermudez, man, this guy's gassed out. Why is he so gassed out? Because it's so much grappling that it just cooks him. It's not his regular fight where he's standing at range, where he's throwing some strikes, where you know he's getting into a rhythm. This is constantly fighting off takedown attempts, constantly trying to get back up to your feet, constantly trying to keep this guy off of you. That's tiring. That's taxing. And that's the kind of thing that Manny Bermuda is going to have to do to Davy Grant, because Davy Grant's way stronger than him. But I think you nailed it. The one thing he does good is his jiu-jitsu. Almost all of his regional scene victories are by way of submission. They when call it comes him the to Bermuda's the UFC, triangle. He's got a great triangle. He's got a great armbar. He's got a great guillotine choke. Um, I think we've seen flashes of high-end jiu-jitsu out of this kid. And you also got to realize that being so young, he's probably getting a little bit better, a little bit better. Davy Grant is massively inactive. I mean, when he was coming out of the Ultimate Fighter and he fought Chris Holdsworth, people kind of had a little bit of hype on this guy. He's huge for Bantamweight. Maybe he can make something happen. <clears throat> Does okay in the first round with Holdsworth. Gets submitted in the second round. Okay, no big deal. Comes back, picks up his first UFC victory. It's the Damien Stasiak fight. I am not high on Damien Stasiak in the slightest bit. I believe I've never bet Damien Stasiak, oh, maybe once. Uh, not my kind of guy, not my kind of UFC level fighter. I thought Davy Grant was going to roll on this guy. And it's probably 1-1 going into that third. And he just doesn't have the means to pull out that victory. He doesn't have that extra gear. He ends up getting submitted by Damien Stasiak. This is a spot I could see the exact same thing happening. I honestly think he's better, way better striker than Manny Bermudez. Yep. I think he's a stronger guy than <clears throat> stronger guy, sorry, than Manny Bermudez. He keeps this fight standing. All indications would be he should box him up. If I'm looking for an underdog, the plus 185 on Davy Grant, tempting, tempting it is. But the one thing that Bermudez does, those submissions, that is the one thing Davy Grant has massive troubles with. So. I expect for him to just find an opportunity, take that opportunity, whether it be a triangle, whether it be an armbar, whether it be another guillotine choke, I expect him to find that opening and, and capitalize on it. 8800 is expensive, you're going to need that finish from him, but uh, if you're playing a big GPP, you got to get those big points. That 8800 might be a little bit cheaper than the Arnold Allens of the world, they might be cheaper than the Neil Magnes of the world, but the ceiling's just as high, if not higher. So I, I could definitely see some plays coming in for um, one Manny, Manny Bermudez at the 8800. Uh, Eric Spicely, 8,700. Darren Stewart, 7,500. Minus 200 Spicely, plus 170 Stewart. We've basically, over the last couple of years, made a, made a podcast about, about fading Eric Spicely. It hurt us a lot against Charlie Thiago Santos. Santos. But most of the time, like, you know, these two guys have, uh, are 0-5 in their last, uh, the last five fights collectively between the two of them. It's a pink slip fight. And Darren Stewart coming off of, I actually cashed it uh, just before the fight went off. I decided to, to bet uh, Julian Marquez, who had never landed a submission in his career, uh, 11 to 1 against Darren Stewart, because this guy just likes getting tapped. Like, that's what, this is how this guy loses. And the, the fight before that, he was submitted by Robertson. I know Robertson is. He's got a, uh, a few submission wins on his uh, on Still, his Still, he's a kickboxer. He's by a kickboxer yeah, by trade. By nature, he submitted yeah. uh, Darren Stewart. Darren Stewart, if you get this fight to the ground, especially a guy like Spicy. Spicy's the best grappler that he's taken on hmm. at, at the UFC level at this I mean, point. Prince Marbroso is a better grappler than Eric Spicely. Uh, he's a terrible fighter. Artist. He's a terrible fighter. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. Best submission fair, artist fair. that he's taken on. Now is, is Spicely. Spicely is awful. We usually fade Spicely at all, at all costs. I'm hoping that people fade Spicely here um, because of his reputation and the fact that he can't really strike. But one, he's usually pretty tough. Uh, he's able to take some damage. And... It, when he gets this to the ground, he's going to submit Darren Stewart. I, I can't believe I'm going to do it, but I'm going to be rostering Eric Spicely. And then I'll hate myself when he takes like a body kick and, 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 and crumbles. In yeah, the first round. yeah. And it'll, be, it'll be like, oh my God, you have faded him all the time and you, you finally roster him. 
and this is what you do to me, Eric Spicely, good thing you're getting cut. That's what I'll be thinking at the time. I'm actually shocked that that this fight is happening because Darren Stewart, he would he signed a four fight deal when he first came to the UFC. He the first fight's a no contest, but that's still a fight off your deal. Then he gets that rematch with Broso, he looks terrible. Then he gets submitted by Roberson. Then he gets submitted by Julian Marquez. Those are his four fights. Why did somebody <laughs> renew this guy's contract? I don't know. I don't understand. Surely this is a one-off. If he loses this, he's got to be gone. The, the the one thing that worries me about Eric Spicely is I hear 100% everything you're saying. And I, and I do agree to a certain I extent. I don't like saying what I'm S- saying. Spicely probably gets Darren Stewart to the ground. When he does, he's a better grappler. He's actually got some sl- slick submissions yep. to him. The one thing that I don't like about Spicely is that he seems to have about two rounds worth of cardio. And that's it. Most of his fights typically all end inside the distance. I don't think he's gone Darren Stewart past isn't some sort of cardio fair. beast either, though. What? It's not that he's a usually cardio he gets, beast. Yeah, it's, usually he gets, you're right, usually he gets, he gets submitted so long before that ever happens. Yeah. Well, well like, he didn't have great cardio against Barroso in their, in their rematch. Yeah, but at least that fight went three rounds, and Barroso's not the kind of guy that's going to push the pace, but you're getting taken down by Barroso, you're getting out grappled by Barroso, at least you, you know, last the distance. Against Roberson, Roberson's a big feared striker right you kind of get backed up you're kind of respecting the striking a little too much maybe get caught in a couple spots and then you get submitted the julian marquez fight man this guy took an ass kicking but you know something marquez started to tire in that fight darren stewart seemed to kind of come along a little bit and then he was getting hit with massive shots that i'm sure that in itself took a lot out of him but for spicely when spicely goes out there he pushes hard for those takedowns he pushes hard to beat you quick if he doesn't beat you quick he starts to get massively tired himself and then either he'll get submitted or maybe you'll find a spot to put it on this guy and i'm just a little tad bit worried that if i'm rostering eric spicely and i put him in multiple spots if he doesn't get that first round finish if he doesn't get that second round finish he's gonna tire he might fold over he might quit on himself they're in liverpool the home Hometown fans are definitely going to be behind a guy like Darren Stewart that maybe, just maybe, he will be able to pick up his first actual UFC victory that doesn't incur after he headbutts Francis Marbrosa in the face. Uh, obviously got changed to no contest. But man, like you know you said like, oh, I'm going to hate myself for putting on Spicely. I may hate myself for having like a little whiff of a guy like... Um, Darren Stewart? Yeah, because 7,500, he could finish Spicely. When he gets Spicely. submitted in the first round, you're going to be like... Yeah, yeah. And trust me, I felt that last week with Kondo. I was like, God yeah, that was really bad. damn it. You were supposed to get some I was points. All over her. She just got hoofed in the I body and crumpled over. But that's Kudos the sport. to anybody who saw that being that easy. Right, but that's that's the sport, is that all it takes is that one big strike. I don't think Spicely is as competent striking as Darren Stewart is. No. So if Stewart knows that the gaping hole in his game is getting taken down and gets submitted, then keep this fight standing and use some cardio and use some range and just tire this guy out. Feed him that jab over and over until you find the opening to land the big right hand, until you find the opening to kick him to the body. Get out of the first round. This might be a live bet situation, whereas if he survives the first round, Spicely starts to get tired, maybe he can pull out the last two and pick up a decision. Maybe he can just, you know, do enough in the second round to tire him out and finish him in the third. The opportunity is there. The 7,500 is not a bad price as far as DraftKings goes. And I'm saying that because I don't really like a whole lot of those sub-7,500 people. I don't like a whole lot of these sub-7,800 plays, but... Two of them that I definitely am looking towards is Mads Brunel and Darren Stewart because I think they have a path to victory that could score them a lot, and they're probably going to be lowly owned. Nordine Taleb, 9,100, minus 321, minus 320 on the betting line. Claudio Silva, 7,100, plus 260. I don't know what the hell to expect from Claudio Silva. His last fight was a win over Leon Edwards, who had we were looking at it just before, what, nine? This is like his 10th fight coming up against Cerrone yeah, since they yeah. had this fight back in 2014. It's like his ninth fight. Hey, that's an impressive win when you go back and look at it and look at yeah. what Leon Edwards has become since then. His only other loss since then has been against uh, Kamaru Usman. So, like, the guy has went on a run, Leon Edwards, that is, since he lost to this guy by, slip, by split decision. Uh, good luck trying to predict what, what this, what's this guy been up to. Like, what has he improved? He broke his foot, and then he had another injury. He was supposed to fight in 2015, then 2016. Uh, he had another injury, which wasn't really labeled on Tapology. And then now he's now we're in 2018. It's been four, almost four years, like to the day kind of thing, since his last UFC fight, since his last fight in general. I don't know, but plus 260 is super wide. Like, I, it, it's a tough, really, really tough spot. Nordin Taleb, on the other hand, is a guy who... And really, we were kind of hard on him when he first came into the UFC, but this guy's been making a lot of improvements himself. 
Now you could say that a lot of his level of competition has been kind of low, and his best win is probably a uh, over a faded uh, Eric Silva. I don't know, man. His but last, like last nine, winning is Daniel Roberts. I mean, it was a 59 second yeah. head kick. Like that looked true. awesome. This guy, this guy All was used to be kind of a, wasn't bad. It's true. This guy used to be a a, a real type of decision kind yeah, of guy, yeah. and everything's kind of coming together. But he's getting a little bit older. But it doesn't. He doesn't have any signs that he's slowing down. There's uh, Silva is the absolute wild card on this card, though. Like if you're taking a lot of shots, like. I don't hate sprinkling it in and be like, you're, you're basically rolling the dice that maybe this guy's really improved and he's going to show it. But I, I literally don't even know where to begin with uh, breaking this one down. The line's super big. Yeah. If you have a hot take and you seem to know, there's a lot of value on Silva, who is seemingly, four years ago at least, was pretty good. Yeah. See, I, I don't really think he was that good four years ago for being Doing all in the UFC. Honest. Fair, fair. Went over Leon Edwards. Fair. So I worked one of his fights one time. He's fighting Xavier Fupa Pacam on the regional scene. And he Ooh, looked. What? Say Zav- that five times fast. Xavier Fupa Pacam, Professor X. He fought in the UFC. Okay. Lost to Dennis Kang. Um, anyways, basically just a French Muay Thai fighter and terrible grappling. And I think his pro record right now is like 23 and 18. Uh, almost wins just as much as he loses. Not very good journeyman in every sense of the word. He fought Drew McFedders too, actually. Good times. Good times. Anyways, he almost beats Claudio Silva. And I'm thinking, and then I think it's Super Fight League. Bottom end Indian promotion. I'm thinking, geez, this Claudio Silva guy is not that good. At some point, he's going to step up and he's going to lose. Not going to make it to the UFC. Doesn't really have the juice. He has got terrible cardio, Paul. That's one thing about him is that he's very good on the ground. Obviously, BJJ black belt. He tries to get the fight to the ground. He will get the fight to the ground if you're not all that competent. But his cardio is terrible. And I'm just waiting for a good moment to fade this guy. Makes it to the UFC. First fight in the UFC is against Brad Scott. He wins the first round getting some takedowns. The second round, he gasses out. Brad Scott beats his ass for that second round. It's 1-1 going into the third. Brad Scott makes a kind of a bonehead decision. This guy just runs forward, gets a quick little trip, hugs onto him, ends up squeaking out that third decision. Very nearly lost to Brad Scott. Okay, fair enough. Then he gets the big fight against Leon Edwards. Looking back, that's obviously going to look awesome. But this is a very, very, very green Leon Edwards Mm -hmm. who wasn't really known back then. I believe that was his UFC debut. And a lot of people think that Leon Edwards still should have won that fight. Because this guy, he gets some takedowns, but he's getting taken down. He tires out. It's not a very pretty fight against Leon Edwards, but he gets that decision. And now he's three and a half years removed from that. I know what you're saying 100% when you when you mention the fact that he's a wild card. Maybe he's gotten better. But he now he's in his mid-30s. So I truthfully don't believe that his cardio has gotten any better. I feel like the guy that he was then is the guy he's going to be now. But when you look at recent examples of high-end jiu-jitsu guys coming back, whether it be an Alberto Mina, whether it be an Antonio Braga Nito, these guys come off long layoffs, and we have the same conversation. What have they been doing? Apparently, fuck all, dude. And apparently, yeah. certainly not working. They look their worse cardio. usually when they come back. Because they're they're older versions of themselves, and the game's passed them by. Now we got dynamic strikers. Now we got guys that can stuff takedowns. This guy's wrestling, by the way, is not very good. He relies on trying to get a trip takedown. He relies on trying to get a clinch with you. If he comes out Nordine's here, Nordine's super, super big and super, super strong. Nordine used to fight at 185 and did not look out of place. Yeah. Like the guy's completely jacked. And when you look at the fact that he had two failed tough runs, super embarrassing. The later of the two, very embarrassing. Since then, the improvements that this guy's made are astronomical. When he loses, Worley Alves, yeah, catches him in the guillotine. The other fight was with Santiago Ponzinibbio, French contender. Close fight, man. He gives Santiago Ponzinibbio a good little fight. Now, when he fights the Oliver Endcamps of the world and the Danny Roberts of the world and the guys that are a little lower end, he beats those guys. He puts on good performance with those guys. I'm actually surprised that the UFC, seeing Nordine coming off a three-fight winning streak, seeing Nordine actually looking good and making some progress, why would they just give him a guy returning after three and a half years? It makes no sense. If I was the UFC matchmaker, I would have put... Nordin Talebigan's Neil Magny as the co-main event. And now I'd have had this Craig White guy potentially fight a guy like Claudio Silva. And then maybe a Claudio Silva can dip his feet back into the water. Yeah. But he's jumping in against Nordin, dude. So the guy is working hard. His takedown defense getting better. He's a much better striker. If Claudio comes out here and fails on the first couple takedown attempts and this fight stays standing, Norlin's knocking this guy out. If he just gasses and he starts doing this flop to his back pull guard, because by the way, he's a guard puller, he's not above trying to just flop to his back to try to get the job done, then he's going to need something big. 
And, uh, you know, unfortunately last week, the first fight of the night, Felipe Silva going exactly to plan and the floppy guard puller pulls off the <laughs> knee bar. So, so is that possible? Yes, it does happen. But if I'm, playing, if I'm playing probability, I got to yeah. take Nordine La Machine to lab here. We got that Tom Breeze taking on a Dan Kelly. Tom Breeze, 9,000 on DraftKings, minus 310 on the betting line. Dan Kelly, 7,200 plus 255. Old man Dan, what can you say about this guy? You got to you gotta, tip, you know, tip your hat to him, give that him some true. respect. That this guy, true. I think this is ninth or tenth fight in the UFC. He has been the underdog every single time. I think every single nine. time, baby. And he's six and three in those fights. Yeah. It's like everyone always expects this guy to get his his ass beat, and he's won in against Rashad Evans. And Chandler Carlos Jr. That is a good win. That is a very good. Yeah, win. Yeah, and he's he's just gritty, Rashad Evans. I don't care gritty, about that fight. hard nose. Yeah. You know you're gonna get a, a proper effort from him. Tom Breeze came in a little, quite a bit of hype, and then when he took on uh, Nakamura. He was, it was kind of a letdown spot. Everyone was big on him. He was a massive favorite, favorite. And that one was super, super dicey. But I think that we get back on track here. I think he's the better athlete. I think everything would lend towards Tom Breeze being able to style on, uh, on old man Dan, who I just think we've been talking about for a while. And, and, and we've been on old man Dan in a few spots here. I don't really like when they match him up against younger guys that are getting considerably better because old man Dan is going the other way now. I think we've finally seen, like, he's 40 years old. He's getting super slow. And I think they've brought him over to jolly old England to, to lose to the prospect here. Yeah, listen, uh, I th don't think there's any secret here that Dan Kelly and I don't, don't meet. He's not my kind of guy. He's a tough old gritty bastard and you have to respect him i believe i used to refer to him as old man dan the can and i'm not going to say that anymore <laughs> he has earned my respect he steps up he fights tough guys he's always the underdog and like you say he wins more times than he loses coming as the underdog thing is some of those fights like steve montgomery and luke zankrich like eh, i don't know why he was the under pat walsh in high insight he can beat those guys. It's when he's taking on better guys, better athletes. Sam Alvey knocks him out. He can keep the fight standing. He knocks him out. Derek Brunson, same thing. He can keep the fight standing. He can knock him out. Those better guys, he's going to lose to them. The Antonio Carlos Jr., that's the big win. That's the marquee victory for him. And he was getting his ass handed, handed to him until Antonio Ooh, Carlos baby. Jr. gassed him. Yeah, that first round, he's getting styled on bad. He gets his back taken. Now you're thinking, okay, he's probably just going to get submitted here. But he survives. Good for him. And then in that second and third round, yeah, the guy's a warrior. I mean, he went to the Olympics four times, Paul. He's 41 years old. He's the most accomplished Australian Olympian of all time. It's not just in judo. How many other athletes ever go to the Olympics four times? For wrestling. The get well, for judo, for judo. But uh, in yeah. his case, I mean. I just mean, in, in high insight, it's hard to stay at the highest level. And even though Australian judo is not exactly premier, um, they're not a premier country in that sport, the fact is he's been an athlete for a long time. But just think about when he's on the Ultimate Fighter and his knees are shot. They're butchered. When you look at him in the UFC, he's got a massive amount of tape on these things just to keep him stabilized. It's almost a miracle to me that he keeps chugging along, that he keeps getting these fights in. But they're not, they're doing him a great disservice by putting him up against young, quick prospects. And that's what Breeze should do to him. Breeze is a tall guy. He's going to have the height advantage. He's a much better boxer. He does a great job of utilizing that range. And if Dan Kelly's going to have to rush forward to get the clinch, and let's face it, he always rushes forward. He's going to eat some shots. And when he eats those shots, how is he going to hold up? I'm not sure. However, and I don't see this very often, there's a path for Dan Kelly here in that Tom Breeze survive, survive the early onslaught. Even then, just to go back to that Keita Nakamura fight that you're talking about. In the Keita Nakamura fight, he's getting taken down by Keita yeah, Nakamura. True. Keita Nakamura is a tiny-ass welterweight. Now he's moving up to 185 pounds. He hasn't fought in two years, and he's moving up to 185 pounds. Dan Kelly is a pretty big dude and a very, very strong dude. So if he's able to back him up to the cage and he's able to get that clench, maybe he can complete takedowns. When he completes takedowns, if he gets them, I suppose, yeah, Tom Breeze is good on the ground, and I'm going to say better on the ground. But Kelly's that big, strong, old warrior that kind of makes you pays and Who spots. was able to survive in submission, the, the worst of submission situations against Antonio Carlos Jr. So, like... Uh, of course, of course. You can't, you can't say that anybody can necessarily just take him down and sub him. Like, that's... that's yeah, that's the thing. That's he's, a tough spot. He's a grizzly guy. He's a hard-working guy. But with Breeze, his next fight after Kaden Nakamura, where he, he does win the fight, 
maybe it's a 3027, but all probability, probably 2928. So he, he, those takedowns kind of proved in some spots. Like he was getting out grappled in some spots against Kaden Nakamura, who's a fantastic grappler, but a small guy, is all I'm saying. It's the subsequent fight after that where he fights Sean Strickland. Sean Strickland doesn't really do much in his fights, man. He's very tentative. He stands in front of you and just doesn't a whole lot. Breeze stands in front of him and also just does far less. That's two back-to-back -back fights where he did not look good. After that, he left the TriStar gym, said he didn't like the atmosphere, wasn't getting along with the coaching staff, goes back to England. Now he's two years removed from that, moving up a weight class. There's a lot of uncertainties on this guy. I've always been a big Tom Breeze guy. You know that. I've always thought that he's a good British prospect that could be that next wave of European talent. And I think that he should be getting better because he is still a young guy. And he does have that boxing and he does have that jiu-jitsu. And, you know, presumably he's going to go out there and he's going to get the win over Dan Kelly. But he's kind of teetering on the line of untrustworthy and Dan Kelly has made a killing on me beating untrustworthy guys like Antonio Carlos Jr. who could gas like Rashad Evans who's completely blown to bits. I've been on Dan like, Kelly for most of those and you know what the Carlos Jr. one though yeah, I'm not gonna yeah. say that that was some sort of show when when I was watching that first round I was just like oh my god this is like the worst thing and then as yeah, soon as he survived one, round dude. one you called that one when he, he survived like, round one I was just like just how I wrote it up. No, it, it was a he tough was like spot. a minus five fifty over Dan Kelly, and you called that. And other guys like Daniel Levy, they've made a point of calling that as well. Is that hey, this guy has got a couple if of tricks in the bag. He can survive round three. He's gonna have gas, and he's he's gritty. Yeah. Now I but generally I generally he, always take. If he gets knocked, he can get knocked out by the the, the more solid athlete. That's it, that's what we basically say. Yeah, I generally always take the faster, younger, more athletic guy. And even though Dan Kelly on paper, because of his Olympic experience, is a better athlete no he's not he's much slower he's way more herky-jerky both of his knees are pre presumably shot at this point and he's going to take a couple punches to get that clinch and i'm not completely sold on his chin so i'm going tom breeze but i will recognize that there's kind of a red flag on tom breeze and a guy like dan kelly could do what he's made a career of doing and that's pull off one more upset but my official pick is tom breeze and when i look at the price nine thousand if he's gonna beat dan kelly you would think he's gonna knock out dan kelly the minus 310 i could see myself parlaying that a little bit but i'm not gonna have him on all spots because again he could be my apple pie shitter of the week carlo pedersoli 8600 minus 160 bradley scott 7600 plus 140 fight at welterweight uh pedersoli coming from cage warriors yep and uh, he looks pretty well-rounded watching some tape on him. Uh, coming off of a win over Nicholas Dalby, who the one real red flag about Dalby is that Dalby, after he was released by the UFC, kind of went into a dark time. And then that was his return fight from like his quote-unquote retirement. And Pedersoli, you know, was able to go to the decision, was able to win pretty handily against him. Man, but, it was a close fight. But, I thought it was a close well, fight. Well, he, he, had, he had some real spots, like well, the he head, dropped head kick, that knockdown. Head kick like, nasty. The guy's good. He seems yeah, yeah, very yeah. well-rounded. He's got decent striking. Yeah. He's, got, uh, he's got good grappling. Um, line is actually moving towards Scott. It was like minus, minus 185 earlier in the week, and now it's down to minus 160. So money's coming in on, I guess, the more proven commodity at one, uh, coming down to 170 from 185 is Bradley Scott. Um, I don't know if I can trust uh, Petter Soli enough to get the finish against uh, Bradley Scott. I like a lot of other guys in this range uh, in terms of Bermudez and Spicely. Oh, my God, kill me for saying that. But, like, those are the guys that, like, I see higher, higher first-round finish upside. Yeah. If they're going to if they're going to win, they're probably going to find find a neck, find a limb and, and get the finish early. This one could go. The distance unless petter Soli's ground game is considerably better than what i am really seeing on tape like he looks very functional everywhere i don't see him as like some sort of dynamo though what's your take yeah i don't mind this guy whatsoever i kind of screwed up earlier i said craig white was coming in on four weeks four weeks removed from his last fight but it's petter Soli. Yeah. petter Soli literally just fought dalby almost four weeks ago to the day one day removed from four weeks so you'd have to presume that not only did you just win the biggest fight of your career not only did you just pick up this marquee victory and that you're probably enjoying it a little bit you're probably not right back in the gym the next day shit man that was a war <laughs> that takes a couple weeks to recoup from so you recoup from this fight with Dalby you're just trying to get back in the gym and now you're called and says hey uh, we got a big fight opportunity from you you know, would you like to come to the UFC? You're not going to turn down this opportunity, especially not if you're, you know, put in the time, the effort that a guy like Petter Soli has. So, signs to the UFC, comes in here. We have to assume that this is a continuation from his last camp and that he's still in good shape and that he's still ready to go. 
The thing that worries me with Brad Scott is that Brad Scott's just been all over the place in terms of uncertainty. He's supposed to fight Jack Marshman. That's his welterweight debut. Marshman, not going to make welterweight, let's face it. Botches the weight cut, gets super sick. That fight gets canceled. But he, he makes a big stink about it. You know, he goes to the extent of saying, I have no money. I'm going to have to now take a full-time job because uh, I've spent all my money on this camp. He was going from... Uh, the United Kingdom obviously to MMA lab in Arizona and that's where he was doing a lot of his camps so he spends money he gets ready for Marshman the Marshman fight falls apart now he just goes back home he says okay well try to get me on this card because it's close to home they find him an initial opponent I always have pr trouble pronouncing his name Tulam uh, Salim tu Tuari yeah Salim Tuari right supposed to fight him he bails off the card then he makes an interview where he's like I don't even want to fight on this card anymore no one's told me if I'm fighting I don't know if I'm even supposed to be making weight anymore mind you making weight for the 170 pounds for the first time in a long time the guy's dropping down from 185 so you get ready you do everything you need to do to have a good weight cut against Marshman but then that fight falls apart it gets delayed so now you re have to do another cut for, for Talam now that fight falls apart okay now I don't even know if I'm fighting anymore do I go out? Do I have something to eat? Do I comp continue grinding? His head's kind of been all over the place, and he's really not all that impressive to begin with. I mean, I have kind of underestimated this guy in certain spots. He didn't look all that bad against Jocko. He didn't look all that bad against some of his opponents, but the majority of the thing is, is that the majority of the, sorry, the main thing is the majority of the time, he doesn't look spectacular in any one area. He's a very average guy. And with Petter Soli, Petter Soli seems to be a very flashy striker. He'll throw crescent kicks. He's got a nasty high kick. Even that one he landed on Dolby, it looks like it's a hook. He masks it awesome to come up top with that with that right high kick. And then if you look at any footage of him grappling, yeah, super competent. He's, he's wrestling and he's grappling at that low level Italian level going to those jiu-jitsu tournaments but he's killing these guys man he's got decent takedowns he's got a good guillotine he's got a good rear naked choke he's very opportunistic he takes the back quite well if he just goes out there and just out hustles Brad Scott for two rounds then great but I was sold on Brad Scott's chin like this guy can take one but this last fight against Jack Hermanson he lasts all of a minute and a half and he got, he got straight up pounded straight up blasted Got hit, got hurt, didn't like it, out of there. Prior to that, his fight with Scott Askham is a very close split decision, and that probably stands out as the most notable victory of his career. So he's not all that trustworthy, in my opinion. Petter Soli, the minus 160, seeing how he is coming in on short, such short notice, and that he's probably not 100% because he just came off that big fight with Dolby, I don't love that. The, the 8600, one reason that I'm actually interested in that is that it's a couple hundred dollars cheaper than the other options that you mentioned. It is a little cheaper than Manny Bermuda's by $200, and it's $100 cheaper than Eric Spice but this guy's got that kind of dynamic striking and with Scott coming off uh, a decimation a first round knockout in just 90 seconds last fight if his chin's not quite what it used to be if he's not quite there if he's got those uncertainties in the back of his head of man do I am I gonna be UFC fight? I'm broke I'm fighting in the UFC I'm a professional athlete and I need to go find a job because I have no money and they keep bouncing me around in these fights like all that uncertainty getting ready for fight week all that uncertainty fighting in a, a, a at home essentially in front of your hometown crowd man that's all gonna mess with you if he goes out and he gets clipped and he goes down I wouldn't be shocked and that would pay very well the other thing I like about it is that it is a couple hundred dollars cheaper and whereas I agree with you Spicely's probably got a higher projected rate of getting that finish and I certainly have to think that Manny Bermudez has a much higher projected rate to get that finish those guys Petter should Soli in theory, has the higher floor yeah, and he, I would think he's going to be way less owned than those other yeah, two options, no right? Face. So nobody's going to really be playing this guy because they don't know who he is. He's making his UFC debut. No he is face on, on the notice. website. No, no face on draft. Doesn't have a previous average on points scored because yep. he's never fought in the UFC. These, so these if that causes people, that. that's a good point. So I'm going to fade those other two options a little bit, not on every lineup, but I could see taking a Pedro Soli and hoping that he gets his value. We move to the flyweight division. We've got Molly McCann taking on Jillian Robertson. 8,900 McCann minus 245 on the betting line. Robertson is 7,300 plus 205. Watching tape on McCann. Just kind of looks like a brawler, really. But she's from Liverpool. They bring in somebody from across the pond over to take her on in her hometown early on the card. Kind of get the, the crowd fired up. And she, I know she's the Cage Warriors champion, but like, this doesn't look like a dynamic talent. That being said, everybody who came off of that season of The Ultimate Fighter is like full out on fade, fade watch moving forward. Like that season where uh, Nico Montano, she may be okay fade moving watch. forward. Fade watch. She's going to fight Shevchenko, man. No, yeah, nobody's going to beat Shevchenko. But I mean, like everybody from that, from that card, everybody, even if they got the win or whatever, like they're, this is not 
a, a high level of MMA. Once the other people from 135 or 115 start filtering in and, and filling out the, the, that division, like these people who were four and two, like Jillian Robertson, who got a first round finish because their opponent had no business ever being at the UFC level, um, they're, they're going to be set up to, to fall like dominoes here. I think that's what they're doing here, bringing somebody from overseas to take on McCann, Cage Warriors champion in Liverpool. But, like, I don't like what I see from McCann. Like, this does not look like a high-level fighter. It looks like a scrappy, a scrappy girl who is going to go to war. So if you're one thing that maybe you wanted to roster is, is based on volume, like, I think she's going to she's gonna put the heat on uh, Jillian Robertson, but I don't know enough about her game to really feel good about it. What about you? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna have to go with uh, with McCann on this one. I think uh, McCann, McCann. I think it's McCann. The yeah, we're both on McCann. Like I still said McCann. I didn't. I didn't say I'm going with Robertson. I just don't think that either one of these girls are any good. Now I know what you're saying, but going back to basically, she's just a brawler. She's just a tough girl. She's scrappy. You know, she closed that. Dish. She just kind of makes it an ugly fight. Makes it a war, so to speak. You and I were watching Veronica Macedo versus Andrea Lee last weekend. And even though Macedo, certainly on paper, you know, she's got the karate background, she's a little more technical, maybe. Andrea Lee just bullied her around. And yes, she was the bigger fighter, even though it was Macedo dropping down from 135 to 125. But she was doing stuff like that head and arm toss. And you and I spoke about it, that you can get away with certain moves like that at that this lower matter. level, right? I'm Especially not, in this division that is still developing. This division is, v is still developing. That those kind of wild brawlers push forward, push you up against the cage and just try to rock them, sock them, robots you. Those, you know, single collar ties, hockey fights almost, so to speak, that just be aggressive. That almost works at this level. That season of the Ultimate Fighter that Robertson's coming off of, you look at the good girls in that season and they're struggling mightily and they're mid-level. And I, I like Lauren Murphy, I do. Barb Honchek, always been my girl. Roxanne Modafferi, uh, even Sinhara Eubanks was honestly 2-2 two and two as a professional going into that show. Nico Montano wasn't a very outstanding fighter. Those are the good fighters from that show. Deanna Bennett was even supposed to be good, and she's back in Invicta. You look at the lower-end ones, the Jillian Robertsons who beat Emily Whitmire, the Shayna Dobson. I honestly am not sold on much Shayna Dobson whatsoever. Those girls there are as cannon far as you could get. They were just filling up roster spots on that they show. They had to fill up a card and And they did fill up a card. And they did. And, 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 and there were like there were like four arm bars from Garden. Arm bars. We were talking about that on the weekend too when we were of watching course, the fights. Of course. And we were just like, How that doesn't happen see? in high level MMA. Everyone knows the escapes at this point. And that happened like four times on that card. It's just like, oh, arm bar from guard. Oh, uh, head and arm throw. Oh. Armbar from Greg. Yeah. Now, one thing with Jillian Robertson is that she was actually, I believe, 8-2 and two as an amateur. Um, I know she's listed as Canadian. She's never even fought on Canadian soil. She's literally been in Florida for a very long time. She's on American Top Team. That leads me to believe, oh, geez, you know, American Top Team, they've got an awesome women's team. Surely this girl's getting better. However, I just don't think she's at that level. I don't think that she has any belief in her own striking when you see her on the ultimate fighter doesn't seem like she has much confidence in her striking she is very much a grappler get this fight to the ground and grapple and with mccann mccann is short dude like you can get her down i've seen her get down but she's scrappy she makes you work her fight i believe against lacey shuckman shuckman's a veteran man she's savvy she's gritty she goes out there she breaks these girls down man she puts it on them I just feel like her style is probably good enough to pick up a couple victories over the lower level, and then she's got to show us what she's capable of. Her last fight with Cage Warriors, I thought it was her best performance. I think she's getting better. She's someone that takes her training very seriously. She goes out and she seeks high-end training partners. I feel like she's making more progression in her game than a girl like Jillian Robertson is, even though Jillian Robertson is the one of this, you know, super mega gym. But I think you nailed it as well when you say Cage Warriors champion in Liverpool, hometown girl, who is presumably the lowest level of opponent that we can bring in that's currently on the roster mm -hmm. that isn't some British import that we're also signing for this one fight. Well, well it's, the ones that, it's the ones that got the wins at the bottom of that tough finale card. Yeah. Because the other girls got, got sent and those back. Were all got fight, sent back. those are all fight for your job fights, yeah, right? If you win this fight, we will. you can you be used as cannon fodder on a European card. Exactly. And if you lose this fight, you're probably going to get signed by Invicta or go back to whatever the hell it was you were doing prior to signing here. So I'm not trying to bash on Jillian Robertson. I just feel like she's very rudimentary. I feel like she's very green. And she's not ready for this level. Whereas McCon went out and won the Cage Warriors title. Traditionally speaking, you win that title. That is a ticket to the UFC. Because it's hard to beat it. you got to go through decent talent and she fought some decent talent to get there so i feel like she'll get the job done where her ceiling at is in the mma world i don't know she's still fairly young she does got that style that she will have some interesting fights with some better fighters but yeah someone with nice footwork that's able to dance around
around her and you know intercept her as she's coming forward. That'll be the way to beat her. Jillian Robertson, not that good on the feet. She might spend a lot of time on half guard here. She might spend a lot of time just trying to avoid the strikes. I'm not sure, but I got to go with Molly McCann. The 8,900, I'm not feeling it just because I think she can get a finish over Jillian Robinson, but I haven't seen enough from Jillian Robinson to just write her off like that. And then the minus 245 on the straight bending line, yeah, I'm going to be taking some of that. I, uh, I don't mind paying that price for McCann, considering I think she's rather on the safe side compared to some of these other options. Elias Theodoro, 9,400, minus 410 on the betting line, taking on Trevor Hot Sauce Smith, 6,800 plus 330. Let's face it, 9,400. No, it doesn't make Elias sense. Elias Theodoro? Yeah. I, I know a couple of his early his Sheldon Westcott win at the beginning. Um, and maybe like the Narvaez fight. Maybe he paid off that price tag. Paying up for Elias, who, let's face it, he's a gritty, uh, decently well-rounded guy with good cardio. Great cardio. That's, that's how he wins His style does that's not lend to DraftKings scoring. Mm, and no. Trevor, Trevor Hot Sauce Smith is is competent enough in all facets of the game to make this probably a three round drawn out fight that is probably relatively close i think uh, theodoru probably outgasses him has is the more physical domineering bigger stronger guy but <laughs> 9400 that's a full fade on DraftKings. minus 410 not feeling it uh, maybe, maybe, maybe Theodoru by decision. I don't know what the price is on that. That could be the only thing I could really jump on board if it was like really good odds. But I bet you it'll be like minus two fifty for 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 him by decision. So it's like this this fight is just pure pass across the board. We like Elias. He's from Toronto. Um, you know him personally. He's been on Pat Ma or Pat Mayo was carrying his. Belts around one time. On his shoulder. <laughs> yeah, it's a, a great Pat Mayo moment. If he has the picture handy, he'll probably throw it up right now. Um, but yeah, let's face it. The guy averages 70, 70 points for a fight. I understand that the odds in the DK are, are kind of based off of, are based off to together. So it's like he is the second biggest favorite on this card. So naturally, he has to be the second biggest DraftKings guy. But it's just like, Nothing from his earlier fights leads me to believe that 9,400, like, how, how do you do that? You got to pay up for Magni if you're paying up this high, or you just drop all the way down and, and make more of a balanced lineup, I, I, I got to think. Mm -hmm. Th this, to me, is a perfect example of why, uh, even though we live in the world of computers, even though you punch in the stats and you're going to have, you know, an algorithm and it's going to tell you who to pick and those people are going to win, a, you know, a lot of the pot, this is why you still need to have a conscience. This is why you still got to make a decision. The reason why I feel that Elias Theodore is so big here is that he's a minus 410 favorite. So the consensus being that he's a 4-1 to one favorite, he's one of the biggest favorites on the card, uh, that he's going to win this fight. So then you look at, as far as DraftKings purpose goes, when Trevor Smith loses fights, his opponent generally scores huge on him because he cannot take a punch. He has got a terrible, terrible chin. So if you think, just based on the numbers, Elias is a 4-1 to favorite, he's likely going to win this fight. When Trevor Smith loses fights, he generally gets iced. The opponent scores a lot. Elias Thoreau, therefore, should win and should score a lot. Elias doesn't have but that He doesn't striking. have that power, no, man. Exactly. And you don't need a whole lot of power to knock out Trevor Smith. But you need to be able to crack. And that's one thing Elias doesn't really throw his hands all that much. He's got a kick accelerated game. He moves. He kicks. He moves. He kicks. He moves. Where he he doesn't score a lot he needs to get his wrestling involved if he can kick that much because let's face it he does throw a lot of kicks if he could gain significant strikes based on his kicks and then complete some takedowns and maybe have a couple passes on the ground then he could get some value but he's not going to take down trevor smith because quite frankly trevor smith's a better wrestler than him and trevor smith's a black belt so mm -hmm. elias is going to do what elias has been doing and that's just dance on the outside and pick shots with those kicks Two things that worry me with that game plan. First of all, Elias has been involved lately in a lot of really close, terrible fights, but he doesn't blow these guys out. Like the Sam Alvey fight, I think it's a 29-28, but nothing really happens. It's a boring-ass fight. The Cesar Mutanch fight, man, some people thought Cesar Ferreira won that fight, but it's a really close fight. Nothing really happens either way. The Brad Tavares fight, man, he just does nothing. He just gets backed around. And the thing with Smith Smith's usually in some greasy ass close fights too when he wins. When he wins, it's like close ass split decisions where it's like, oh my God, dude, I can't believe Trevor Smith won again. This guy is gonna get another fight and then he gets blasted. Okay, let's give him one more. And then he wins, another close ass, greasy ass decision. That's kind of how he wins. The second thing is, Elias Theodoru is a smart enough guy that he realizes 
good looking guy. He's doing uh, ring work for Invicta FC where he's the ring card boy. He's got that long mane on him. So now he's got this website, The Main Event. He's doing videos on YouTube where he's breaking down fights. He's trying to get into acting. He was, he was trying to do The Amazing Race Canada. He got ousted on the first episode. He likes the acting stuff. He likes, you know, traveling the world. He likes doing all that stuff. He's already probably thinking about life outside of fighting. He's yeah. fought good guys. The guy's got balls, man. I didn't. A lot of people thought he was just a pretty boy. But the fight with Tiago Santos, he's got a massive gash on his face. He ain't so pretty anymore. He's bleeding everywhere. He's getting tired. He's getting stuffed on takedowns. And that ref is like, do you want to continue? He's like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. This guy is... He wants to fight, no doubt about it. He's got great cardio. But outside of that, he doesn't really do anything great. He's not a very good striker. He doesn't have that finishing power. His submission game has not really been shown to us so far. His wrestling game is more just try, 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 hope something eventually lands. When he does take guys down, more often than not, they just get right back up, and he's got to stick on them. He's not impressive in any one element. So the minus 410, I really got to be on a lot of... I gotta be sold on the last few doors to dominate Trevor Smith, but I think this is just gonna be another close fight that doesn't score a whole lot. So I don't want it on DraftKings, because even though Smith is 6,800, if he squeaks out a greasy split decision win here, it'd be good for a cash game, but there's too much risk for a cash game. Mm -hmm. And if I put him on a GPP and he gets the win, great, dude, he's only $6,800 and he got a win, but it's not gonna score enough. I need those finishes. I need to go a little bit bigger than that. So he's got a good price tag. I don't like the straight betting line on him. And the flip side to that, Elias is way too much on DraftKings and he's too big of a favorite straight up. I think this should be a close fight however i believe he's 9400 because with trevor smith you just gotta land one man just land that one shot and he will crumple over he ain't getting any younger his chin is not getting any better i'm just not completely sold on elias being that guy to crack the chin but as far as elias goes personally yeah hilarious guy and i think that he could be successful in a lot of different things and he could be a successful fighter this is his level of fight but beyond that, and I see guys on Twitter calling him out and they want fights with him, like a lot of these fights don't make sense for him. Fight this level of guy, have these close fights, but I, I don't really know how far he'll go beyond that. And the minus 410 would suggest that he's some type of status fighter in the UFC or, or, or a contender or a rising prospect, which he's, he fits none of those categories. Lena Landsberg, 8,500, minus 115. Gina Mazzani, 7,700, uh, minus 105. Landsberg was like minus 150 yesterday, and then money's come in on Mazzani, or the line has moved towards Mazzani. Basically making Mazzani and Darren Till are the two odds values on this card. Till, I can understand a little bit more. We're in his hometown, that type of thing. We have not been very nice to Gina Mazzani. Um, over, like the course, Gina uh, over the course of her fights in the UFC. You know, you watch on tape. And there's nothing, she's nothing special. Right. But somebody out there likes her, and uh, this has basically become a pick -em. She's going to be owned on DraftKings. Um, and Lena Landsberg is a little bit, a little bit long in the tooth. And we've seen that, like, she's in these tough, gritty wars. So, and she doesn't have much of a takedown game. Like, that's where Mizani really got dusted against Sarah McMahon, is she was just out muscled, taken down. And dominated. I don't know if I see the same from Landsberg here. It could be a close fight and close fight uh, 7700. I don't hate a play on Mazzani. I won't have any Landsberg. Um, what's your take on this fight? Yeah, well initially I like Gina Mazzani the $7,700 like I think I, I think she's a competent fighter She's the sister of Dave Mazzani never made it to the UFC, but was a was a good, Alaska guy. Yeah, yeah, Alaska guy tough uh, Regional scene veteran guy fought in Africa fought kind of all over fought good guys It never got to that higher level, but I like him now. They're both full-time in Las Vegas with extreme couture um, spent some time with syndicate they're they're both functional fighters, but obviously we're talking about her. She's functional in the sense that she's an okay boxer. She kind of has an amateur boxing background, but she's not great. Her wrestling is more kind of like Elias in that it's effort. You know, you go for those takedowns. Eventually, you can have opponent flop over. But when you take on a girl like Sarah McMahon, you're not taking her down. You're probably not actually really striking with her and having any effectiveness here. So you're going to get blown out of the water. Her last fight in China. It's perfectly tailor-made for you could probably take down this girl. You could probably grind out this girl. And that's what she's able to go do. It's that really low level. I'm thinking initially with Lena Landsberg, her takedown defense doesn't really show much prominence. If Gina Mazzani just goes out there and scores a takedown with her, I, I would have every reason to believe that she'll probably start styling upon her. Aspen Ladd in their last fight, Lena Landsberg and Aspen Ladd, competitive first round. That second round, Ladd gets her down with kind of a bullshit takedown like it wasn't a nice setup it was more so level change 
bulldoze you to the ground. When she gets on the ground, she's got nothing, man. She basically gets passed on right away. She gets in a full mount. She's just getting struck. She has nothing other than go to your side and take more punches and then flatten back mm. out and take more punches and go to your side and take more punches. Now, Aspen Lai is a big gal. Don't get me wrong. Like She's having trouble even making the weight at 135 pounds. So having a girl like that on top of you in mount, yeah, probably difficult to get out. But Gina Mazzani's a tough, rugged girl. So if she goes out there and her game plan is obviously don't, don't stand with a girl whose nickname is the Elbow Princess. Don't stand with a girl who comes from a Swedish Muay Thai background. Take this bitch down. And if you do take her down, then you probably have the tools to, to score points, pass, hopefully. But then I watched some tape on both of them, and honestly, this fight's just going to happen in the clinch against the fence, and Lena Landsberg loves the clinch, mm -hmm. man. She'll literally just punch her way into the clinch where she can get you know a hold of you. that sounds like? Just rip you with knees Low the body. scoring. They never give any sort of points in the clinch. In the clinch is not counted as a quote-unquote significant strike. Yeah, because a lot of the time it's like two or three knees to the thigh and a knee yeah. to the body and then an elbow and then you separate and then she'll land, she'll throw two punches and one of them might graze and one of them will miss but then she gets back into the clinch. Aspen Latt, I'm sold on Aspen Latt. I think she's a very talented girl. That first round with Landsberg and Aspen Latt, dude, Lena Landsberg actually outstrikes her like 35 to 15 but it's all in the in the clinch strikes it's all i'm gonna press you against the cage and land these knees to the body but last doesn't even try for a takedown mm -hmm. the second round lad's corner is like yo change levels take this girl down and as soon as she even attempts that it's to the ground she's styling on her so mazani's clearly gonna have a good game plan she trains with a good team they know the game plan go in here get these takedowns but if she doesn't get these takedowns and it's largely just going to be a sloppy grapple fest against the cage standing with a lot of clinch work then landsberg's just going to do enough to ever so slightly um, just do enough to score points, just do enough to get the decision. That in the end, I feel like Lena Landsberg is probably just going to get the decision. The 8,500 on DraftKings, not interested, not interested ever so slightly. But the minus 115, I can be coaxed into that. I, I'm not going to put her everywhere. I'm going to have some plays on her. I might even be able to go her, say, by decision. But I think it's unfair to write her off in that she makes her debut on relatively short notice at 145 pounds against Cyborg and manages to at least get into the second round before losing. And then after that, Lucy Putalova, well, she didn't turn out to be half bad. And her eyes swollen shut, and she grits through it, and she fights through it, and it's a tough fight. And she eventually gets the decision, even though it's a contentious decision. And then in her last fight against Lad, starts out well. And then, unfortunately, a lot of people actually think that fight's an uh, early stoppage. I don't, but I had money on lads, so what do I care? But in this spot against Gina Mazzani, it's quite possible that she can go out there. And, and if you're in the European crowd, they're going to be cheering for, even though you're from Sweden, they're going to be cheering for you over Gina Mazzani. Every time you land those strikes in the clinch, they're going to be cheering for that. If Mazzani just doesn't really have that same output. I can see her squeaking out this decision. It's not going to be the most exciting fight. It's not going to be the highest scoring fight. But, but I can see Lena Landsberg getting the decision, so that'll be my, uh, my call here. ESPN doubles down. On the UFC, they're supposed to do this UFC or ESPN Plus deal, where UFC is going to get like or like all of their, you know, the Ultimate Fighter, yada yada yada, a bunch of these online content things. We're going to go on to it, and then they're going to get 15 events, and then we just find out that now they are going to do like, what, 45 events, like another 30 or something like that. Yeah. Basically, kind of evaluate or like the valuation of the UFC at 4.2 billion dollars. Doesn't actually look all that bad anymore. ESPN's going to be kind of making it more mainstream. We're going to have Stephen A. Smith going off on tirades about MMA because he'll be forced to talk about it. Uh, it's an interesting time for the UFC moving away from Fox. Uh, what's your take on it? So I, I don't know, man. Honestly, the deal is predicated on let's give you more events and we're going to get more money. But I think the UFC's problem right now is that they have too many events. As a result, like, you have a lot of... Yeah, we have a card that we just talked about here that it's like... It's, yeah, man, it's hard like, to get excited about Lena Landsberg versus Gina Mazzani and Molly McCann versus Jillian Robertson and Carl, Carlo Pedersoli versus Bradley Scott and all of the, these the, guys. Like the, This card is the, on this on is on, telltale man. sign of how... We don't have that many big events right now. Yeah, and I think if you look at it, it's like Brad Scott doesn't fight very often, and, and Tom Breeze hasn't fought in a couple of years, and Claudio Silva hasn't fought in three and a half years, and a lot of these guys don't even fight that often. As well as you look at the main card, the, the main event is a good main event, and that's how they're trying to sell this card. Here's a good main event that we talked about, could be a dud, but at least here's on paper a fun, exciting main event that has implications towards it. It's meaningful. The people are invested in it. Neil Magny, him versus Gunner, could have been good. It would have been fun. That falls apart. That's not necessarily their fault, but having Craig White on the main card, 
card? That's embarrassing. Arnold Allen versus Mads Burnell on a main card? That's embarrassing. Makwan Amir Khan and Jason Knight? That's a fun fight. That's good matchmaking. And that's the kind of fight that I'm not going to complain if it's on the main card. But you put this on any Fox card. You put this on a regular fight night. It falls to the to, to the to the main card. Sorry, to the to the prelims at best. We're looking at a pay-per-view coming up in Chicago where Alistair Overeem versus Curtis Blades is on the prelim portion. It got moved not down on the main there. card. That's fine. That's a kick-ass prelim, dude. Yeah, that's yeah, fantastic. Great. These cards have got Manny Bermudez versus Davey Boy Grant is on the main card. It's mind-blowing, but that's what happens when you spread yourself super thin. When you want to go to Chile, is there a market in Chile? I don't know. We have one Chilean fighter on the in the UFC, it seems like. Let's put him on a main card over there. You have this English card. Not very big name guys. What if they make guys. these just shorter cards, though, for the USP ESPN deal? Rather than having a 12, it wouldn't be good for DraftKings. You want more fights, like 12 fights. It uh, just allows for different things on in terms of roster construction. But in terms of for television and the enjoyment and not having to spread yourself so thin, if you have like a seven fight, eight fight card, where you just, you know, you push some of these other four fights at the bottom of the card that nobody really cares about, or the four fights that people don't really care about on the card, you spread those across the course of a year. That could be maybe the direction that they're heading here. Because like, if you're, if you're putting up 13 fights, once and then sometimes twice a week if they're gonna have 45 cards plus pay-per-views i'm not sure how it's all gonna shake out but like think of a, they're gonna have to draw in more fighters and like if, if they're gonna do that like we're, we're getting close to 60 fight cards in you know 52 weeks in a year doubling down on some 13 fight cards Think about the tomato cans we're going to be getting into the UFC. Yeah. No, I hear. And you look at Dana White's contender like series. They may, they, may, they may pull it down a little bit. Like well, They I, may be I, I don't, I shorter don't, cards. I don't know, dude. Because the contender series, I'm not sure if it counts towards this this overall number. Yeah, but those are just more. They're five fight cards. I like those. Yeah, they are. Five fights, easily, Tuesday nights, easy. Easily digestible. It's on Tuesday. Totally down with that. But now you're awarding one or two more contracts every week to another guy. Those guys need fights contractually obligated, they end up on these cards. Even if you were to pare this card down to eight fights, what are the eight best fights on the card? It still even wouldn't be a very sexy card. This card, though, has one saving grace above all else. Main event? Sunday afternoon. Yeah. That's great, man. I I, I, I'll consume this. I was going to watch it anyways. Let's yeah, be real here. Come on. I'm <laughs> saying the average person doesn't want to watch this on a Saturday night. The average person is not me and you watching this Chilean card on a Saturday night until 1.30 in the morning. Yeah. That's not the average person. The average person doesn't mind saying, hey, I'm going to have a couple beers, kick my feet up on a Sunday afternoon. Yeah. Card starts. Oh, it starts at 9.30. Maybe I'm up by 9.30. If I'm not up by 9.30, then I don't care about the first two cards, Lena, Lena Lance. It's like the main versus. card starts at like 7. Or sorry, at noon, sorry. Like you're out of there by 3 o'clock in the afternoon. At noon, man. It's perfect. At 3 o'clock in the afternoon. If this is on a Saturday afternoon, great. If this is on a Sunday afternoon, even better. It allows you to still plan towards that you can just consume this. You're getting ready to go out. You have the fights on the TV. Perfect. If they, they're going to do more cards, then just have earlier start times on them is all I would say. I get genuinely excited being like, oh, there's fights on today. I wake up in the morning. I feel awesome. But I hate the anxiety of being like, Oh man, first fight's at six thirty and it's only eleven thirty. Oh man, it's oh, two o'clock. Oh, we have a six fight oh, main man, card on, uh, yeah, on like, Fox Sports One. Okay, this yeah. card's going until two o'clock. Do in I the take morning. a nap? Do I not take a nap? Can't start early <laughs> drinking because if I'm starting early drinking, yeah. then I'm not smoking any weed because then I'm not gonna make it to the main event, right? This, this is good, man. I'm in on this. What so about do more of those. And great, but I, 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 what I'm getting at is when you have so many events, it's hard to just capture people's interest on a Saturday night all the time. I talk to people that are fight fans all the time. No idea their favorite fighter's got a fight lined up in two weeks just because there's so many fighters. Oh, yeah, there's happens, so much man. happening. You go to a news site and, you know, there's a big story that just got announced, but then five other matches have been made since then. So we Dude, just get pushed down. It's, like, it's like the Magni versus Gunner fight. Uh, Pogi Rob was telling me. He was just like, oh, is that the, when, when I was telling him about... Uh, watching this card. He was like, oh, is that the one with Magni versus Gunner? I'm like, let me tell you a story about a guy named Craig White. Who's <laughs> <laughs> coming yeah, in dude. to take on Gunner now. So like, it's so hard to yeah, keep up yeah. until you actually look at the card the week of. But uh, well, one last thing. Fabricio, ju or juicer or nah? I know he got caught by USADA, but that doesn't really necessarily mean that he's been juicing this whole time. Yeah, well, two trains of thought there. First train of thought, probably hasn't been juicing the whole time. The second train of thought is, like, it is innocent until proven guilty, and too many times you 
pop on an USADA violation and everyone just drags your name through the mud. Yeah. So I want to give him the benefit of the doubt in that he's been fighting at a very high level for a very long time. He had previously not been caught for anything. He had previously passed all his tests. This is an out-of-competition test, like a month after he had lost. So taking the type Maybe of Maybe he's like, beating, I lost to Volkov. Now I got to get back on track. Yeah, but when you take that kind of beating with against Volkov and you get knocked out and you don't have anything readily matched up, then why are you hopping on the sauce, mm. right? Wouldn't you give it some time? Wouldn't you get into camp and start trying to get your body to peak physically? The guy's in his late 40s, man. There's no doubt that the temptation of or maybe I want a competitive advantage Or you is lose there. to Volkov, you go, man, that sucks if I want to continue to compete. Oh, I just lost to Volkov. They're probably not going to check me. Let's get a couple cycles going. Let's go, and uh, all of a sudden there's like, hey, uh, Fabricio, <laughs> you're busted. Yeah, okay, I, I, I hear you. I just, like, I just like that Colby, Colby wow. Covington cover, uh, you know, came, came after him ferociously yeah. on Twitter. Well, there's a, the broom right. there's a conspiracy that theory going around that, that 100% of the people that have assaulted Colby Covington <laughs> with the boomerang have then popped for USADA violations. So... All I'm saying is there might be a curse. Don't throw a boomerang at Colby Covington. All jokes aside, um, yeah, obviously we knew he was going to take a shot at him. He took a shot at him after Volkov kicked his ass. He was definitely going to take a shot against him here. I mean, that's kind of what Colby Covington's shtick is. He goes out. He tries to be the super villain. Uh, he's a pro wrestling fan. He kind of knows his role. This Colby Covington used to win all the time in the UFC, and nobody gave a shit. Because he doesn't really have a particularly exciting style. He doesn't talk. No smack on the microphone whatsoever. He had like a four or five winning streak going on. All four wins by way of finish. No one gave a shit about him. Nope. He's getting matched up with like Max Griffin and Jonathan Minier. They don't even want to give him a good fight. The Warley Alves fight again he lost. But he had to do something. Or else he, the prime fighting years of his career were just going to float by. And he wasn't going to get nothing. So he talked a lot of ludicrous ass shit. And it's got him a title fight. So yeah, maybe you hate him. I get it. I, I like him. No, no, I'm you know that. I'm on the I'm on the Colby Nerd Bash. Nerd Bash 2018. 2018. Let's go. Yeah, always hanging out with those porn stars. Gash Bash 2018. In some cases, Rash Bash 2018. That's why you have to wear a condom. <laughs> but Colby, assuming that he doesn't pick up something prior to fight time, will go out there and if he if he wins, you want to see him get his ass kicked the next time. And if he gets his ass kicked. Good times. You're going to high-five your buddies. You're going to have a drink, and you're going to laugh in his face. But he's there to serve a purpose. Uh, that wasn't the question. The question is, Fabrizio Verdun, do I think he's a juicer or not? Yeah, I don't know. I, I honestly feel like he comes from an era where everybody was on something, and now he's in his late 40s, and his body's breaking apart. And he doesn't – he's not – I want to see what he got test positive for because he seems to think that it's a mix-up. And far too often in this industry, uh, tainted supplement is the excuse that everybody throws up, and it's bullshit – 95% of the time, but what about the 5% of the time where it's legit? What about the 5% of the time where you are Leota Machida? I've been taking the supplement that I buy over the store to GNC yeah. for 10 Which years. Which they've done scientific stuff on before, and they've, they've done tests on DHEA, whatever it's called. Yeah. Um, and it, it, there's not real substantial proof that it actually gives you that much of an advantage. Of course, and, and a lot of the time we see with South American fighters, and I know what people say, oh, the cheating Brazilian or the cheating so-and-so. All I gotta say is it's not as regulated over there. So you buy something and you look at the, the, the ingredients in it and it is clean. And you take it, and it's got some type of manufacturing error where they've got something else in it to make you super jacked and swole or to make you, you know, it's a diuretic, which you didn't even know there was a diuretic in it. And Or you're just trying to get your Viagra on while you're in Thailand. And, you well, know, that's what I mean. That's those, what I mean. Those, those, those guys all those have an excuse. Just yeah. Those have an all excuse, but you get the feeling that it was or like... Or like clenbuterol, where you're eating steak from Mexico, and it's just like all of the all of the beef in Mexico is just injected with this uh, with this steroid that, that will make you piss off by USADA standards as well. Yeah, yeah. And when you look at the guys like the Vitor Belforts and the Vandele Silvas and the Anderson Silvas and the Fabricio Verdooms, yeah, maybe they're all using something. Maybe they're all on something at some point. Those other guys probably get classified as no good cheats. The thing is, I don't care, man. Just, I honestly don't care. Was he going to be any that much better with he was on or what he wasn't? I don't know. Can you go to Bellator and find out? Chael Sonnen's a no good cheat. I love Chael Sonnen. I don't care. It's that when you try to get one over the honest guy, because I'll tell you one guy. I'll tell you one guy right now who's not cheating. 
let's say old Nick. <laughs> that, <laughs> that guy was as clean as it can be, okay? He is just hard work and greedy USSR upbringing. And Fabrizio Verdum versus old Nick was, was the, the lock fight. of the century that was about to happen. Of course. I don't like pulling one over a guy like that. However, if you're fighting Alistair Overeem and you test positive, I don't care because chances are... He's on something. Yeah, he found something that's not as effective as Uberim used to yeah, use, yeah. but uh, he's still got something. Yeah, and if and doors. if you and if you would have on his day on his door <laughs> on that day, you would have got him. But you did Fabrizio that day, and his two days later. So like that's the way this stuff works. Is that a lot of people who they just read the headlines, you know, drugs in the system. Uh, a lot of it is just it's it's you you take it. It's in your system. It's out of your system. They've got to catch you almost in the act. Chael Sonnen, when he was on EPOs and he was on human growth hormones, it was something like you'd have to catch him the day he used it. And they did catch him. Yeah, he knew it. He talks random about it on his podcast. Random where he says that, struck of luck, man. He said that there was, like, there was like a two, it was like a 48 hour win. Like he had it down to, he'll talk about it on his podcast. He's very straightforward of about course. it. No good just cheat, like It was like a 36 hour blood. window that they could have came in and caught me. And then they caught me. What, yeah. what am I supposed to say? When I first met Paul Shaughnessy, he was a dying baseball fan. Guy liked baseball, but was starting to get a little burnt out from it. And I remember we spoke, and you said, man, you got to realize I grew up with Mark McGuire and Ken Griffey Jr. and guys slugging home runs, big bombinos. People loved it. Baseball was popular again. Everybody got on board. You take that away from it, and eh, it's kind of boring. Barry Bonds is the GOAT. Yeah, I, I'm not saying no I want to see all steroids. these guys on steroids. The Bobby thing is, Gears. is that there's no program in the world that catches 100% of the people. So the guys with money will get through for the most part. For Bezer Verdum has money, obviously he's not getting through. But the guys like Josh Barnett, who's a no good cheat, who tests positive again and then just fights it in court and gets away with it, those guys can pay for that. Those guys can do that. For Bezer Verdum will fight this and likely win. John Jones is fighting his and he's likely gonna get a reduced sentence compared to some other poor schmuck who fought on a Bellator undercard who's taken a three. Mike Richmond, four year ban. Why? He can't fight it, but he's cheating just like everybody else in the Bellator prelims, right? So it's a it's a fickle thing, right? I, I don't want to take the stance of pro steroids because I'm not. I want to see everybody fight clean. Thing is, is that not everybody's ever going to fight clean, right? And I think a lot of sports are like that. It's not just fighting. Most sports, there's a steroid epidemic whether you're having the same results of people getting caught, right? Hockey's had, what, one positive test in the last 25 years? Well, because hockey, two hockey positive nuts tests? will say, oh, steroids wouldn't help you in our sport. And it's just <laughs> how like, would it not? How would it, How would steroids not help you in any sport? Do you want to know something funny? So, but, like, that's what that's the argument yeah, all that yeah, nobody yeah, yeah. ever gets caught for. It's just because like, they don't test for it. Yeah, D Lance Armstrong never they got caught. They test for other things. Lance they don't Armstrong, really test for much at all Lance in the Lance Armstrong NHL. never failed a test. No. Barry Bonds never failed a test. But those guys are widely considered They also don't no test NHL cheese. players for cocaine, let me tell you. Yeah, most of them are on cocaine. Why do you think, yeah, why do you think look, Vegas has done so well this now year? Look at the, <laughs> now look at the Russian <laughs> Olympic team, right? They get banned from the Olympics because even though they weren't failing tests, turns out they're all on something. So they say, okay, you can't represent Russia at the last Olympics. You can be athletes from Russia, okay. The first pop test that they had was the curling men and women duo, okay? I told my dad, I says, what a dummy. First of all, you're Russian. You know you're gonna be under the radar. Or sorry, oh, like you know you're gonna be under the mic uh, microscope. You know these people are gonna be looking at you. You know you're gonna be tested. Why would you even do it? That's first thing. Second thing, he, he's playing curling, Paul. What, how, how could steroids possibly help you in curling? Sweep. Hurry hard. He was so jacked that sweeping to him was like, <laughs> oh, dude. He was like pulling up. He was, it was pulling up layers of ice. It was quite the sight. And I was like, yeah, but couldn't someone who's just clean and a good sweeper do as good of a job? Maybe. Maybe not. There's always a competitive edge that can be gained of out course. of this. And that's what makes me feel bad with guys like, uh, you know, um, a Jason Knight. Jason Knight's not trying to cheat nobody. Nope. He just likes to fight. He likes to go in there and he likes to throw hands. He's taking on Ricardo Lamas, who's not only a better wrestler than him, not only a better wrestler than, or a better wrestler, and probably a better striker, and you know all these things. He's on a program, man. I mean, think about it. The guy is a top five guy in the world. Been top five for a long time. Top of his game. It's not crazy to think that those guys are using something. Whether it's going to fail a Nusada test tomorrow, that remains to be seen, right? But. There's, there's no like one size fits all for this problem. It is a problem, sure, but I don't know how to fix it. Maybe you could say let them use something. I always say like monitor the levels. 
say that you can use a certain amount. Like horse racing is the same thing. You're not allowed to use drugs. You get caught, you get a 10-year ban. So nobody's trying to get that competitive edge because they don't want the 10-year ban. But yeah. but the stuff that they're getting caught on is like, oh, this helped. It was a muscle relaxant. Well, isn't that good for the horse? Or this is a breather. It helps them breathe better. Wasn't that, well, like, why, why is this stuff even banned? Well, it's a competitive advantage. Yeah, but it's just trying to help them out. Crow Cop, when he told them after the Gonzaga fight, hey, listen, guys, I'm using something. They give him a suspension. He's out of the UFC. He has to go fight in Japan and now just pulled out of his Bellator fight. But he's using it for maintenance-related purposes, right? Now you see him in Japan. Mm, those are not maintenance-related <laughs> purposes. Yeah. But as far as the UFC went, he wasn't trying to cheat nobody, I don't think. He was just, he's got a bum shoulder. He's got a bum knee. He had to maintain been, the Ferrari that he that he called his own body. He's been fighting professionally for the 20 Lambo. years. You know, his body's shot. I, I always said, this is my course, last these point. These older guys. This is my last, yeah, yeah. My, my last point is that I always said right from the get-go, when they, because you were allowed to use TRT, you need an exemption, okay? If you're a Pat Cummings, or actually I guess he would fit into it now, but if you're some of these younger guys that want the TRT, no, no way. But if you were 35 and up, I'd give it to you. Dan Henderson, give him TRT, dude. The guy's in his 40s. He needs it. Vitor Belfort, we want to see Vitor Belfort. The problem is you can't say yes to dude. people. 35 and up. Yes 35 and saying. up. 35 and up. That's, I think that's a fair rule because these guys can stay competitive and we they're the names. They're selling the pay-per-views. Yeah, but then you get a Vitor Belfort. Come on. Why not? The disadvantage... TRT Tour was looking a little bit different than fair. somebody who was getting a slight competitive edge. The guy was super jacked and then as soon as they took that away and brought in drug testing, the guy was a complete monster. Okay, so you take away that and then as a result, you have Dan Kelly versus Tom Breeze on the card. You have Bradley Scott on the card. Vitor, need, you need guys like that to sell pay-per-views. And they're not competitive as they get older because their bodies are shot, probably from years of steroid yeah, use. Yeah, of course They're not is. producing testosterone why are, anymore. Why are you going to let these guys have a competitive advantage that most of these guys who really need it, like a guy like Vitor Belfort, it's because they've abused other steroids in the past. I, the I, I think baseball, everybody should be able to take steroids. Certain sports that aren't contact sports, everybody. If you're a curler, take all the juice you want, bud. If you have to, you know, take it out on that ice, do, do your thing. But like MMA, it's a little bit different when you have people punching and kicking each other in the head. It's like if somebody dies and you find out afterwards that this person was all juiced up, it's just like, well, what what are we really doing here? Okay, here's my kind yeah, of argument the, to the that. The personal safety, the life, the, the long-term safety of somebody yep. is at risk by letting them do drugs. Okay, okay. So my counter argument to that, and I do hear that a lot, very often, obviously. Yo, this is not baseball. This is not you know, one of these other sports where you're not taking direct trauma to the head. You cannot let these guys that are inflicting damage on each other use gas because now basically they're just cyborgs. They're going out there and destroying each other. My counter argument to that is how did these guys get to the UFC? They fought in the regional scene and the regional scene's unregulated. If you look at boxing, boxing is largely unregulated, but you'll get 30 fights without even doing a test. Most of these guys that fought to this level, do you think Craig White's getting tests in Cage Warriors? No, and Cage Warriors is a prominent MMA organization, but the rest of these guys are not getting tested. Now they finally make it to the UFC. Now they're finally making money now the risk is worth the reward and now you're not going to use stuff you use stuff to get to this level most of the guys in the regional scene and i've worked with a lot of regional scene guys these guys are are two and oh amateurs that are just gacking up so they can go out and beat some guy up in front of their friends and family and have no uh, they don't even want to go pro they're just doing it as something they can do in the weekend in between their jobs for a little bit of excitement and they're using you go to these regional scene you guys guys full of back and you see guys that are completely ripped and they're fighting schlubs that have never taken anything in their life yet have never even really stepped into a gym before and they smash these guys you're taking damage before you even get to the UFC when you get to the UFC now you're getting paid now it's probably worth it for you that if this guy's on something and he smashes you at least you're getting 20 grand out of it but now you're gonna go clean because you're worried about trauma and damage like it just doesn't really make sense to me Mark Juan Americano we talked about it earlier Maquan Mirakani is not really fighting all that often I mean he fights like once a year doesn't really but when he was on the regional scene he was fighting all the time dude at any point, the guys that he could have been fighting were juicing, and yet he's fighting all the time. Now he makes it to the UFC. Now everybody's clean, and you don't want to fight all that much anymore because it's harder. Well, you use stuff for maintenance. You use stuff to keep you in peak physical condition. So, I don't know. I'm probably arguing against myself, the, pop, the pros and the cons. I'm very undecided on it, but you asked a very loaded question on, we got into a steroid talk over, of, is Fabrizio Verduma cheat? Sure, maybe, but to a certain extent, human beings are cheats, right? Everybody's trying to get a competitive edge Who throws a boomerang, somewhere. Right, man? I mean, honestly. A roid rage piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> he also literally right. tries to scrap everybody half of his size at media luncheons or on the street, or he talks a lot of medical shit at people. 
He's just he's a, kind he's of a, a he's shitty he's guy, kind of man. A general scumbag. So yeah. this is karma. He's always kind of come off exists. as like that real fake nice kind of guy. Yeah, he's really got that nice goof. Guy. He's got that goofy face, but it's a troll face. He's trolling people. It's true. Anyway, that's more or less it for us. We kind of went really, really long at the end there. Um, hope you enjoyed the show. Want to thank Cody Saftik for uh, breaking down the fights with me and uh, Pat Mayo for hanging in there with us as we talk for like 35 minutes about steroids and so on and so forth. For both of those guys, I am Paul Shaughnessy saying goodbye and good luck. Experience! Experience!